So how about those pesticides, huh? <laughs> okay, before I do that, I know we've been here now a year. Um, we have some new additions to the lab, so I just wanted to refresh everybody's mind. Um, we have Bernardo, he is my uh, lab manager. Also we have Cameron, who's a PhD student. He should be around here somewhere, hopefully. And I will be presenting a portion of his work. Also Trisha Wolf, I know she's here in the room. She's sitting right there. I will talk, in a, little, talk a little bit about her work. We had Stephanie DeHay, she was a visiting master student from Netherlands. She's also done some work. She's actually completed a study with us this summer. So she was a busy, busy um, student. Uh, and then the latest addition to our lab is Charlie Nye. He is going to be the Laidlaw facility manager. He's starting December 1st. Um, he's been traveling the country. He actually came from Gene Robinson's lab in Illinois. He's done some work with May Barenbaum as well. Um, he, as I said, was it has been traveling the country. So I'm hoping to see him here today, but you never know where he ended up um, these past week. And he's, I always like to point out, he'll be great in California, right? He's eating grapes and drinking wine. Okay, so how are honeybees doing these days? I'm pretty sure all of you here have seen um, this graph many, many times, right? Honeybees are not doing so well, especially annual losses seem to be doing, um, seem to be going up. And what are some of the causes of these losses? Well, as you all know, Bee Informed Partnership has been doing a survey, and this is the one from uh, that just came out this year, 2015. Data is from 2013, 2014. Of course, we have. Uh, varroa and pesticides that are still sort of seen as uh, some of the top causes as the reasons for colony loss. Um, and those are the two that I will be focusing on. So I'm not only going to be talking about pesticides, but I'll be talking uh, about pesticides in context of how we can uh, help get rid of varroa. So these are the three topics that I will be covering today. And of course, we'll start with the first one. This is a, uh, this is the study that was funded by California State Beekeepers Association last year. This is actually the first time the results are being presented, so we're still working it out. So we're we're calling it preliminary results. We're still working on the data analysis, and I know there's some experts here of Jim Frazier, so hopefully he'll be able to maybe point us in the uh, better direction of analyzing and maybe reanalyzing data. You know, it's never done until you publish it, so um, still lots of work to do. Of course, we're thinking uh, California State Beekeepers Association, who have supported Cameron, who's done a tremendous amount of work this summer on this study. Also, we'd like to thank Ivonic, who has provided a sample for us. Um, and then I'd like to point out here Kyle Gray. Kyle Gray is an undergraduate volunteer student, um, so he was not paid, and he's done a tremendous amount of work with Cameron. So it's really a pleasure to have all of these young enthusiastic students, and actually he, uh, two of them together are now writing the paper up. Uh, we might have to do some follow-up work, but they're definitely working on it. And this slide looks very, very busy, but uh, just to give you an idea of what we've been working with this past summer, what the goal was really to look at, uh, uh, see if there are any synergistic effects of amitraz. Everybody here knows what amitraz is, right? We use it for control of varroa mites. So synergistic effects of amitraz with some of the other uh, uh, pesticides that the honeybees might encounter out in the field. So we had insecticides, we looked at some fungicides, we also looked at a couple of herbicides, and then this organosilicone adjuvant. Um, so let's see, and why? So why, I mean, I don't think I really need to tell you guys why we're interested in looking at pesticides and the effects on bees, right? Um, high levels of miticides and agrochemicals have been found in hive matrices, um, and there is a lot of use of pesticides out there. This is the use greater than 193 million pounds of active ingredients have been used, uh, used in California alone. And of course, we have a lot of uh, pollination going on sometimes at the same time, so it can be, it can be um, troubling. So how did we choose pesticides? Of course, we couldn't possibly test every single pesticide, not in our little lab, you know, with the Cameron and Kyle working, it would be 24-7 job if that was the case. So we wanted to narrow it down to some of the uh, chemicals that are uh, more common, right, out in the field. Of course, um, amitraz, degradates have been found in the hives, um, and also we 
focused on some of the pesticides that have been found in the hives by Moen and also Karen Ranich's data, uh, more recent data. And of course, we focused and looked at the pesticide usage in the state of California um, and in those pollination relevant pesticides. And of course, breakthrough here is that organosilicone adjuvant that we talked about. Um, that might be of interest. Uh, however, the usage data was not tracked federally. Um, and in fact, in 2013, California just started tracking the amounts used. Um, so data apparently was not very clear. Okay, so the experimental design, um, I think it's fairly straightforward, but um, I actually have, a, if you go back, I have to say, we have a UC Davis booth in the back, one of the little rooms in the back, so you should stop by, check it out. And we have a sample of one of these cups that we've used for uh, experimental um, setup here. Um, so what we did with these cups, with Cameron and Kyle, that these are just cups that you would you know, drink your beer out of at a party. Um, and they melted wax. They either uh, added anatrize to it or not. And they aligned the inside of the cups with that uh, wax. Um, they also added substances that they added were in sugar water. They added then 30 bees per cup, but they had six technical replicates, so six cups per combination, and they had three biological replicates, so they tested this in three different colonies, so we know that there's no um, weird genetic effect. Okay, so here are the cups in action. I thought it was pretty ingenious. They actually taped, it's very simple, fairly simple, but very elegant, so they taped uh, a piece of tape in the cup inside, and then they lined it with wax, and they t uh, they took that tape and took it off, so they created themselves this little window so they can actually see inside the cup, because another goal of ours, it wasn't just to track the mortality, but to really see if there are any sort of behavioral effects of these uh, pesticides or combinations of pesticides and miticides. And um, I like to point out, there's me actually being in the field. It's probably the only time. No, I, I think I went out into the field uh, twice this year. And when I started this job, I swore to myself, I am not going to be sitting at the desk writing and you know, not going out into the field. But I guess that's just the nature of the job. So I was very happy to be able to help at least a little bit out in the field uh, to contribute. Okay. Um, so these bees were acquired from colonies that were raised on brand new equipment, and we actually did do a pesticide analysis of these colonies, the wax, pollen, and adult bees, and it was pretty clean. It was actually really nice to see that it was pretty clean, that it was really no, no pesticides that were of concern. Um, then what we did, we took several frames of bees out, and we just sort of shook them down onto a tub and whatever didn't fly out, whatever bees didn't fly out, we used those in our um, study because those are newer bees, they were not able to fly off. Okay, so this is Kyle, um, he did all the observation under the la red lights because you know, bees can't see red light. They measured the mortality daily for 10 days and then every other day for 10 days after that. Um, and of course, they uh, checked the tubes of uh, sugar water with the substances of interest, and they refill them as needed. So here is the first set of results, and this is just a, a survival analysis that you can, you know, you put your data into a software and you ask the software, is there really any difference between in mortality between those bees that were exposed to pesticides with and without amitraz? So here, we really wanted to see if there's a synergistic effect of amitraz when the other pesticides are present, and can you, let's see, what do you think, just by looking at these things? Here, I'll, I'll there you go. No synergistic effect. Um, so that was for the group of four insecticides that we tested. When we looked at the herbicides, we saw something similar. This sort of look here is that there might be a little bit of a difference, but it still wasn't significantly different. Um, we also looked at, Fungicides, and again, you're seeing something similar, very similar picture um, to here. Again, no synergistic effect. And you know, when you get the negative results, you always are a little sad and upset, like, man, I wish there was something groundbreaking in here. But then you sit, sit back and think, well, maybe this isn't such a bad thing, right? Um, so again, as I said, these are some of the preliminary results. We really have to sit down and think about what we're actually seeing. And it's worth pointing out that again, as we hear over and over again, 
this is not a realistic situation for the bees. These things were done in the cages. We just wanted to um, do sort of a screen, a quick screen to see if anything stands out that we can follow up on. Okay, speaking of standing out, um, this is the only significant result that we got in this study, and it's that organosilicone adjuvant breakthrough. Um, however, if you look at this here, we did it at two different dosages, 10 parts per million, 100 parts per million. This was guided by uh, one of the Chris Mullins papers that, that the dosage was. And interestingly here, there was a significant difference, but those that were not in combination with Amitraz uh, actually were surviving uh, less. So it had higher mortality. So it's sort of opposite of what you would be expecting to see. And interestingly also, we didn't see anything at 100 parts per million, but we did see effect of breakthrough uh, on survivorship regardless of Amitraz presence. So if you take that, you know, if you just take into account whether they were exposed to breakthrough or not, we did see a significant difference. Now, as real scientists would do, right, there seems to be something is going on there, but we're not satisfied with that. So we're um, definitely thinking about, uh, it's not quite clear. The results are not cut, well, or clear cut, right? So we are definitely thinking it warrants repeating. Um, maybe we'll talk to uh, some people and see what might be going on there, if there's anything we can do differently. One thing that Cameron noticed, Cameron and Kyle noticed when they were doing this study, it seemed to, uh, the bees in the presence of breakthroughs seemed to have been dying in clumps. So there was no mortality, and then five days later there was a, a, a chunk of bees that died, right? And then there was no mortality, and then another chunk of bees died. So I don't know much about the chemistry of these pesticides, uh, but it might be something going on with the actual chemical structure that they're clumping in the sugar water, so it's definitely interesting uh, and of interest to us, so we'll be following up on that. Okay, so uh, unbeknownst to California State Beekeepers Association, we actually did another study with a little bit of their funds, um, but you know, you get more than what you asked for, so you can't complain about that, right? Um, so Stephanie uh, Hay was here this summer, She's never worked with bees before, and she really was interested in working with queens. Um, so she wanted to look at the synergistic effect of Amitraz and Savanto. Savanto is a new um, product put out by Bayer, and it's used for control of sucking insects, uh, pest insects. So she wanted to see if there's any effect of well, Savanto and Amitraz, and in combination of the two. So these are the treatments that she's done. What she did with Amitraz, she uh, placed it in wax, and then she dipped these commercially available uh, queen cups. So she would expose the larvae in Amitraz, to Amitraz in such a way. And then Savanta was added um, to protein patties, and of course she had a combination of the um, products. Okay, so these are the parameters that she measured. Um, she evaluated the synergistic effect on number of queen cells that were built, weight of the virgin queens, their mating flight number and flight length, and then she also looked at the retinue response. I'm sure all of you here know what a retinue response is, right? It's the workers that are taking care of the queen, they're licking her, antenating, transmitting the pheromone throughout the colony, right? Um, that, what you see crossed off, obviously there is no effect on those parameters, so if she didn't see any effect on um, those parameters. However, there seemed to have something been going on with the number of queen cells that were built, also mating flight length. So that's pretty interesting. Um, this is the data for all of the different treatment groups, um, and there was a significantly uh, lower amount or lower number of queen cells that were built in those cell builders that had Sivanto in them. Um, I hate I, when they first tell me, it's like, oh, you should get into pesticides. You know, it's always a touchy subject, right? Nobody wants to say, hey, look, there's an effect. Um, so we're trying to be really careful uh, about it. So we are aware that we overall had a low take. Um, so we're planning on repeating this study to make sure that this really is a true effect and it's not an artifact of um, something we're going on this summer. I've talked to a lot of people and uh, quite a bit of them had issues with um, rearing queens. Um, so maybe there's something going on just with the weather. And also what one interesting thing that we're trying to, or will be following up on, I'm really curious to see if this is a direct effect of Savanto and queen development, or is there an indirect effect of Savanto via workers, if there really is an effect. So is it something that is affecting the queens, or maybe the workers that are responsible for, uh, for feeding these larvae, these, rearing these queens, 
maybe they're being affected by Savanto. Um, Savanto does affect the nervous system of the piece, so maybe there's some sort of an indirect effect there. Um, okay, so I already told you Savanto affects the nervous system of an insect, and this is the average flight time of the queens that were in these different groups, and there is really no effect of the single treatments. However, now when you add um, combination Savanto, Amitraz, and Kumapas with her um, positive control, it looks like they were taking a slightly longer time to come back to the hives. So again, we're not sure um, what might be going on there. What could be an effect on the nervous system of the queen, so they were maybe getting lost, not taking a longer time, um, but we will be repeating it in 2016 to see, to follow up if we see the uh, similar results as well. And of course, if anybody has any ideas, I'm more than happy to uh, chat to you about it. Okay, and this was uh, also another pretty large experiment. It was a field experiment, and it was supported by the IR4 project. Um, it was also supported by Project APSM. Uh, we've gotten some uh, material from Gita. They uh, donated Apigard, and we also had Leonard and Linda Pankratz donate the Queens for the project, so thank you, everyone. Um, Bernardo and Trisha were the ones who really took the lead on this project. And what we did this year, at least, we, passed, we tested two different biopesticides this year. Um, and then, of course, we had a positive control, which was Apigard and the untreated control. And so far, we need to be calling these still product B and product A. Product A, we had a low and high dose. Um, so here's uh, some of you know photos from uh, the field. What we've done, um, well, really, what Bernardo and Tim and um, Trisha were doing all summer long, pretty much, they were uh, taking or measuring the uh, percentage of mites in the hives before, of course, and after the treatments. Different treatments were applied. Um, and they also did take note of the colony strength. So they looked at the adult bees, the brood, the pollen, and honey supplies um, that the bees stored. Um, so they've taken quite a bit of data, and as I said, it was quite an undertaking. Um, it took a lot of people to do this job. Uh, so not just the three, three of them. Remember I said we have a lot of undergraduates, uh, interns, and volunteers. So it was, a, it, was a, uh, it was a bear of a study. So here are the results. Um, just to orient you, this is the alcohol. We did uh, alcohol washes for mite counts. Um, these are the uh, really percentages of mites. So this would be, you know, two percent uh, varroa mite infestation. When we started, we tried to um, even out the mite infestation between the colonies because you want to have the same starting point. Uh, this uh, was a, a alcohol washes done 14, 28. Um, 42 and 56 days after the treat, the first treatments were applied. And this blue here is the positive control, so that is our apigard. This light blue here is the untreated control. Then we have um, high dose product A here, low dose product A here. I'm not sure why those two are separate, but sorry about that. And then the middle we have the uh, product B. So not really, ton going on 14 days later, but if we look at the later dates, there is definitely an effect of Apigard, a positive effect of Apigard on for all my populations. So Apigard, so my populations uh, were significantly lower in Apigard colonies as compared to actually all the other treatments. Um, the product, uh, yes, A started off well, started off okay, the high dose started well, um, and then the second product was also doing okay, but then towards the end of the study, so about almost two months later, um, the mite numbers just took off. So um, it could be uh, potentially, we should be thinking about a different uh, application process in these. They, have, they definitely have potential, I think. We just need to think about um, how to apply these products better. And Apigard is actually the only one that had a negative uh, effect, again, on varroa mites. Now, we looked at the numbers of adult bees as well. Uh, we tried to equalize the colonies at the very beginning. Um, we only had four um, dates here. Apigard, again, is doing, seemingly doing the best. So when it comes to numbers of adult bees in the hives that were treated with Apigard, they did the best. 
um, as compared to the other uh, uh, products. And the only one that was sort of on par with Apigard, uh, but still not different than the untreated control was this product B. So just because the product works, right, but if it does something bad to your hive, you don't, you don't really want it. Okay, and this is just showing that, again, Apigard had the lowest uh, effect, the lowest negative effect on the uh, numbers of bees. And also keep in mind that this is sort of uh, heading towards the end of the season. So these uh, populations would be shrinking a little bit anyway. Um, again, it seems the, mes the main message, uh, positive control, Apigard, there is a clear decrease in mite infestation. Uh, again, product B <coughs> appears to be uh, promising, it's probably tweaking the application process. This coming year, we will be testing four more biopesticides. We're probably going to be starting a little bit earlier, um, and we will be collecting data on mite drops as well this time, just to see if there are any differences. And I sh forgot to mention, we actually, um, sort of a side note, at the end of the experiment, we did a cleanup of mites with Amitraz, with Ap uh, Apivar. Um, it was amazing how many mites still fell off. I mean, I don't even know how many numbers. Trisha, was was it something like 500 or something per colony? It was pretty ridiculous. Oh, so yeah, so it's pretty, pretty high at the end, too. Um, and it's amazing because um, I know that every beekeepers throughout the state have been complaining about how mites are just really uh, bad this year. And if you talk to Rob and Ben from the um, tech team up here north, they will also tell you that mites have been going crazy. Okay, so this is as far as the, uh, the research goes. I'm actually the extension apiculturist, so I feel obligated to tell you a little bit about my extension work as well. Um, the, this past year, I've been working with Virginia Bolshakova. She's the uh, director of the Elpis Ranch. It's a wonderful educational uh, facility. So if you have an opportunity or if you have kids and you have nothing better to do with them for a weekend, you should take them there. They love it. Uh, but we've been working on developing best management practice guidelines for beekeeping, uh, specifically, pr probably specifically geared a little bit more towards urban and suburban beekeeping because we take into account the proximity to your neighbors. And I've been also working uh, with the UCIPM folks on developing UCIPM bee toxicity rating. So this is really should be beneficial uh, to the growers, and so not just beekeepers, but growers, so they can input what chemicals they're applying, uh, they're planning on applying in their crops, and they can get an automatic response from the software saying, hey, this is bad for bees or not. So if it's bad, maybe try and find something else to uh, spray. We are also working on developing workshops and classes. This past year, we've actually given six different courses, three beginner beekeeping courses, uh, two queen rearing courses, and then we also had a bee breeding class. So we're uh, always welcoming new students. If you're interested, we're gonna be doing this again next year, and we had some great sponsors, Man Lake and Jay-Z Beezies was uh, supporting the classes, so thank you very much. And we are hoping and planning that all of these workshops, classes, are going to culminate in the development of a, a master beekeeper program. California is a huge beekeeping state, so it would be a shame if we didn't have a master beekeeper program here in the state of California. Um, and we already have some great supporters of the program. We're doing this in collaboration with the Honey and Pollination Center, who also has a booth in the back. I think they gave away some goodies, too, uh, at the beginning. Um, so Honey and Pollination Center, the College of Agricultural and Natural Resources, uh, so UC Davis itself, and I actually just got a phone call yesterday from ANR, so it's the Agriculture and Natural Resources, the Cooperative Extension Division of the UC system, and they, they're asking us to reapply for getting some funding for a master program so that's really nice I mean we are extensions so we're supposed to be extending the knowledge to everybody right and then I have to uh, mention the Gilroy Beekeepers Association who just donated uh, some money towards that program we're also developing programs tailored to school-age children we just developed a, a proposal and submitted it to College of Ag and we're really hoping that this will take off we're going to be doing this in collaboration with our honeybee Hagen das Haven right um, it's a great, how many of you have been here or have been to the Hagen Dust Honey Bee Haven? I mean, we're in Sacramento, so it's pretty close by. If you haven't been there, you should definitely stop by, maybe not now, but April and May, 
uh, the garden is really beautiful. And what we're trying to do there, uh, Christine Casey is the garden manager, and she does a wonderful job of showcasing plants that are pollinator friendly, right? So they're pollinator attractive. She's also doing a tremendous job of making those plants uh, drought resistant or drought tolerant. So the best of both worlds, right? So we're really hoping to see a lot of you there. And I think I will end there. That's also actually also in the garden uh, in May, so you can see it's quite lush and beautiful. So we hope to see you there. I thank you again, especially California State Beekeepers Association. And I have to mention Randy Oliver. He's sitting right there. He was definitely uh, instrumental in getting the study, uh, the first study that I talked about, sort of up and running. So if uh, you didn't like the results, you can talk to Randy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.